Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Mission San Juan Capistrano's Virtual Swallows Day celebration. My name is Jessica Crossman. I am the Education Director here at the Mission. And today I have the privilege of introducing our virtual lecture this morning uh, that's all about the Swallows of Capistrano with Dr. Charles Brown of the University of Tulsa. We are so very pleased to welcome Dr. Brown back uh, virtually this year. Before we get started, I want to let you know that if you have any questions, you can feel free to type those into the chat in the Q&A section if you're tuning in via Zoom, or if you're tuning in via Facebook, you can type those questions into the comment section there. So without any further ado, Dr. Brown, I'm going to let you go ahead and get started. I'm going to spotlight your video. Make sure everybody can see you and I will take myself off. Give me one moment while I do that. All right, go ahead, Dr. Brown. Okay, well, very good. Well, thank you uh, <clears throat> very much, uh, Jessica. It's a, it is a um, pleasure to be back for, I think, maybe the 12th year that uh, Obviously, that we were doing this all in in person, but uh, maybe we'll be able to do that um, do it next year. What I wanted to do today was just sort of go over a little bit about about cliff swallows and talk about the uh, the complex social life that these animals have, and uh, sort of illustrate what a marvelous bird they are. Um, I've been studying them for now forty years. Um, primarily in, in Western Nebraska, where uh, I do uh, field work each uh, summer, uh, typically from uh, the early May and until the, the end of July. So a lot of what I'm going to be talking about comes from our, um, our work out, out there in, in Western Nebraska. But I think that it's, it's probably generally applicable to, uh, to cliff swallows that, that occur pretty much uh, anywhere, including uh, Southern California. Now, uh, first of all, a, 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 a little bit about, okay, I'm having some technical problems here. We can see you just fine from this end, Dr. Brown. Okay, for some reason it wasn't advancing the slide. Um, okay, let's try this. Okay, here we go. Now we're, now we're advancing. Okay, so first of all, a little bit about the, um, the, the swallow at uh, San Juan Capistrano. The, uh, uh, supposedly the, the, the story is that uh, at one time, the birds were nesting on, uh, on buildings in the, in the town. And they, they do that. I mean, they, these birds like to nest under the eaves of, of buildings and um, other sorts of, of structures, but they do make a mess. And um, they were uh, relatively, um, unwanted by various people in the, in the town. And then um, Father O'Sullivan, uh, the, the legend is, invited them to come and, and live at the mission. And the birds formed very large colonies at one time um, uh, on the mission grounds. They were on the great, uh, the, the Old Stone Church. They were up under, as you can see here, some of these, these archways. Um, and through about the 1960s, the numbers were fairly, fairly large um, on, the, on the mission. However, there's been a long-term decline in the, in the number of birds uh, nesting both at the mission and in Southern California generally. And we think that's largely because of, of habitat changes. These birds are really birds of open prairies. Um, historically, they were on uh, cliffs, um, uh, but generally with, with open fields nearby. And as Southern California has become more uh, populated and in particular more vegetated, as trees have been planted, 
um, that has reduced the overall quality of the landscape as far as, um, as these birds are concerned. So the numbers have declined generally to the point now that there are, are relatively few um, in, in Southern California generally and um, itself. Now, we all know that these birds are known uh, for returning generally on, at the same time of year, March 19th. Um, and so really what, what the, the uh, San Juan Capistrano swallow story uh, illustrates is the fact that many animals regularly return in time, uh, at the same time of the year and to the same place. So many migratory animals, even ones like cliff swallows that go all the way maybe to Argentina to spend the winter, they still often return at about the same time of, of year. Um, so it, this has sort of become sort of a metaphor for predictability, if you, if you will. Um, and while they may not always arrive exactly on March 19th, um, they do come back at about that same, same time of, of the year each, each season. So the, um, the North American cliff swallow is um, uh, a relatively common bird in the western half of North America. They also occur in, in, the, in, in, in smaller numbers in the, in the eastern half of the country. They are known by their, uh, their white forehead patch and their square tail. So uh, cliff swallows are different from barn swallows that have very forked tails. Cliff swallows have these, these very blunt tails. Uh, they also have an orange uh, rump patch. So when you see an orange, if you see an orange butt, basically that's going to be a, a cliff swallow. So these, uh, these birds originally nested on um, the sides of cliffs, typically underneath an overhanging uh, ledge, someplace where you had a, an overhanging ledge to provide shelter and then sort of a vertical uh, wall um, that the nest could be attached. So you can see here, this is a, a natural cliff colony. They fit the nests in wherever they can find a, an appropriate sort of, of, um, of overhang. And this is the sort of uh, nesting sites that the birds historically used prior to uh, essentially uh, European settlement of, um, of North America. Once, uh, once people came along and started building things in the environment, um, then, then these birds have, have switched to uh, other sorts of, of nesting sites. Now, one very characteristic feature of cliff swallows is that these birds are highly social. They typically form uh, large colonies. And you can, as you can see here, the nests are very close together. So the nests often touch each other. And this is important for various reasons. One is that it, it makes it easy for uh, parasites uh, to move between nests. So having a neighbor may be disadvantageous in that regard. Um, but also you're very close to your neighbor so you can monitor what your neighbor's doing. So if your neighbor is finding food or happens to know where there's a source of nesting material, you can gain information from your, your neighbor about those, those, those sorts of things. So cliff swallows are very social and uh, as and in fact, among, among land birds in North America, they're one of the most social species with, with some colonies reaching uh, 6,000 nests uh, in, in size. So again, the, the sociality that, that these birds exhibit is shown here where these birds are gathering, uh, gathering mud as a group. Um, they build a, the nests out of wet mud so they, they, they collect mud as a group, they feed as a group, they spend the winter in, in large groups. So, so very social. Now, we want to sort of address two major questions and, and these are sort of the questions that have, have guided our research over the last 40 years. 
And one is simply why are cliff swallows so social? Why do they form colonies? Um, whereas many similar birds do not form large colonies. They nest uh, by themselves. And then secondly, we want to ask, well, why do colonies vary so much in size? Um, so there, there are small colonies of cliff swallows and there are large colonies of cliff swallows. Uh, what are the consequences of living in, say, a small group versus a large group? You can think of it, what are the consequences of living in a small town versus a, a large urban area? So that's sort of guided much of our, our research over the, over the years, these, these two questions. So our North American cliff swallow is one of, of eight species um, of, of cliff swallows generally that can be found uh, throughout the world. And this um, painting shows where the different species are found. They're all somewhat similar they're all social. They all have a, <clears throat> an orange or a, or a light rump patch. And they're found on uh, basically all continents except uh, Europe. However, we don't really understand much about any of these, these cliff swallows except our uh, North American species. So uh, my research is done in uh, Western Nebraska this is a, a region about 200 miles northeast of Denver. Uh, it's near where the North and South Platte rivers come together. This is a, a, a prairie region. Um, in fact, much of the study area looks like this. Um, it originally was mixed grass prairie. And of course now much of it is, uh, is wheat and uh, corn cultivation. Uh, however, there is more to Western Nebraska than than flat prairies. Um, and this shows some of the topographic relief that one sees in the area. Um, and this also shows where our research is based every year. This is the uh, Cedar Point Biological Station. This is a field station run by the University of Nebraska. And uh, we, we come there, my research group and I, and uh, we, we live there. And, and do our research out of uh, Cedar Point Biological Station. And you can see the, uh, the, the bluffs uh, and so forth that are, are found in this particular area. And this shows a, a, an ancestral nesting site for cliff swallows in, in our study area. This is a, a, a cliff where the birds were reported nesting in uh, the 18. Uh, 40s and then again in the 1860s by um, naturalists that went through this area um, along the Oregon Trail. So these birds have, have always occurred in western Nebraska wherever there are, are these sorts of, of cliff sites. But of course the bird has been able to um, expand its uh, inconsiderably as, uh, as people came on the scene and began to uh, construct uh, things such as bridges and, and buildings and, and, and highway culverts, for instance. Uh, many birds nest under the, the eaves of, of bridges, such as this large bridge over the North Platte River. And in fact, you can see all the nests that are uh, along the top underneath that overhang. This uh, colony uh, can sometimes contain up to 3,000 nests on this, this one, one bridge. Now, the birds still occasionally nest on uh, these natural cliffs, and this is one uh, from our study area, but the use of these natural cliffs has been gradually um, diminishing. The birds seem to uh, really, they don't like the, the natural cliffs quite as much. And this is probably because the, the nests are easier, it's easier for predators to reach the nests. And also they're, they're more exposed to the elements, wind and, and rain and so forth. So the birds are, are generally uh, more successful when they nest on, um, on um, bridges and, and, and buildings. Probably what the birds are originally 
were attracted to at the mission was the fact that uh, it looked like a big cliff. So if you look at, at um, landscape photos of San Juan Capistrano in say the 1920s or the 1930s, what you see is basically a flat coastal plain without any trees at all. And then the mission sort of jutting up like this big massive uh, cliff. And I'm sure it was very, very attractive to cliff swallows as a result at that particular um, point in time. So this is uh, one of the uh, uh, artificial structures in our study area. You can see how dense the nests are. In fact, on a, on a site like this, they're basically using up all the available concrete space. So a bridge like this may have 2,000 nests in a, in a span of maybe only 10 meters by, uh, by about um, two meters. So very high density nesting at, at certain times of the, of the year. This is uh, one of these uh, highway culverts, which um, we do a lot of our, our work in uh, for obvious reasons. I mean, the nests are easy to reach. We're able to just walk right in. We can number the nests uh, by riding on the concrete with, uh, with chalk. Uh, this enables us then to monitor the reproductive success of the birds, for instance. Uh, in these, um, in these, at these sites. Now, this is a, 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 a graph that I want to just make one point, and that is that cliff swallows live in groups of many different sites. So I alluded to this earlier, but this is a, a, a distribution of the different colony sizes, over 2,000 colonies that we've uh, documented in, in Western Nebraska. And by colony size, we mean the number of nests at the site. So you can see that sometimes these birds do nest solitarily where the colony size is one nest. Um, but then you get a whole range of different colony sizes all the way up to these that are 3,000 or more nests. The mean colony size, the average colony size um, at least in, in Western Nebraska, is about 400 nests. But what this, this, this is, a, is very, very interesting because it allows us to compare the biology of birds that nest in very small colonies, that nest in, say, medium-sized colonies, and then birds that nest in, in very large colonies. So that's sort of been sort of the, the cornerstone of our, uh, of our research program. Now, just to show how we go about studying cliff swallows, this is, uh, uh, we have to use um, big extension ladders to uh, access the, uh, the nests underneath bridges. This is a big bridge over the South Platte River. Uh, if we need to reach the nest there, it takes quite a bit of, of uh, effort to get out there and um, access those nests. Sometimes we have to do even other things such as swimming out uh, to a, a colony. This was a cliff colony that we monitored in uh, actually in the 1980s. And uh, we would typically uh, swim out to this site um, and then climb up on this, this uh, ledge um, and then go up and, and uh, collect data on the, on the nest there. Um, that's sort of, uh, that's rather involved and we, uh, we haven't been doing anything like this since the, since the 1980s. We look inside the, the nests using a, um, a dental mirror and a slot, and these nests can be surprisingly hard to see in. And it takes some practice in order to be able to insert the mirror in there and, and be able to see the, the nest contents. But this allows us to, to ascertain how many eggs the birds lay, uh, how many babies they fledge, um, for instance. And then some of our research involves just simply watching birds at their nests. And this is really a, a fun part of, of, of the research because you get to know the, the individuals and so forth. Um, but to, to watch birds at their nest, be able to identify them as, um, as individuals. 
And the way we do that with cliff swallows is we, we use these little uh, white forehead patches they have, and we effectively give them barcodes. So using uh, Sharpie uh, pens, we can give them different color codes. So this was, this is orange, blue, green, so OBG, um, and use colors and different combos. Uh, we can mark several hundred birds um, in, a, in a particular colony. And then we get to learn who they are and we watch them and, and learn about their social behavior in that, in that regard. Now, we've also done quite a bit of, uh, of, of marking birds uh, permanently so that we can follow them over long periods of time. Um, and to do this, we, we band them with um, a little aluminum uh, bands, which are permanent markers. And each band has a, has a number. Um, we have banded over 230,000 birds over the 40 so years of the, of the study. And by doing this, then we're able to recatch these birds at, uh, at a later time and figure out how long, uh, which sorts of, of colonies they, they choose to live in. Do they prefer large colonies versus small colonies, um, et cetera. So um, this, this is in fact the largest a banding study of, of any single species in any single study area. Um, and it's yielded a lot of important information for us. Now, in order to, to put bands on legs, we have to, we have to be able to, to catch birds. Um, so one way that we, uh, we catch birds is using uh, nets. Uh, we use what's called a mist net um, in which uh, it's a fine mesh net supposed to look like a mist. And uh, the birds supposedly don't, so they just fly into it, they blunder into it. Uh, so one way that uh, we do that is um, we will take the net uh, strung between two poles, we'll walk out on top of a bridge, throw the net over the side of the bridge, the birds become um, ensnared in the net, and then we pull it up. And then, uh, and then go process the birds, take them out and, and ban them. And uh, this shows that you can catch a lot of cliff swallows uh, sometimes. Um, and so often the, the catching them is not the limiting factor. The limiting factor is, is being able to process all of these birds. And many of them, of course, are banded from, from past years. So it gives us a lot of information when we're able to catch this large number of birds. Okay, so let's talk about some of the, of the drawbacks first of living in colonies. Because whenever you live with others, there are always some automatic uh, disadvantages. There are no automatic advantages, but there are some, some universal costs. And one of those that we're of course quite aware of now is that the more social you are, the more likely you are to um, encounter uh, parasites or pathogens. Uh, you're more likely to, uh, uh, another member of the group may have a parasite or a pathogen that then may transmit from that, that individual to you. Um, and this is, a, this is an automatic cost for all social animals. Uh, social animals are more likely to be parasitized or to suffer from disease. There's also another sort of automatic cost of, of living socially, and that is that as you get more individuals in one area, there's going to be more competition for food, for nest sites, for mates. That's just a fact of life. As you get more individuals together, there's probably going to be less of, of that available. And then another sort of cost, which I want to talk about today, is the chances that you will misdirect your parental care. In other words, you'll care for somebody else's babies. And this is more likely to happen if you're living in a, in a big group. And I'll say a little bit more about that here in a minute. So um, for cliff swallows, what are some of the parasites that they have to worry about? Well, there is one in particular that they have to worry about. 
And this is this thing called a swallow bug, which is a, it's actually a bed bug. So it looks a lot like a, a human bed bug. So these, uh, these are blood sucking insects that live in the, in the swallow nests. Um, they don't travel very much on the birds. And they, so they live in the nest. They spend the winter in the nest, actually. Uh, they're just able to shut down their metabolism. And when the birds are gone, they don't have anything to eat. Uh, but when the birds are there, they feed on them. And we can get very large numbers of them in some of the colonies. So here is one that's engorged with blood that's feeding on a, on a, baby, uh, a baby cliff swallow. Um, and as it turns out that the, the bigger the group you live in, the more likely you are to have these, these parasites or the more parasites that, you, that you're likely to have. And that's shown just simply here in this, in this graph. When you look at the number of bugs uh, that can be found on a baby in relation to the size of the group, what you find is, a, is a simply an increase. So cliff swallows that live in bigger colonies are going to have more parasites that they have to contend with. And one way that they have, that they, uh, or one reason that they have more parasites is that they're more likely to uh, have parasites brought into that group. And we all know that the more you're around new people, the more likely one of those new people will introduce a, a pathogen or a, or a parasite to you. And uh, that's uh, illustrated here when we look at the way these parasites are introduced to colonies. So they're introduced by, uh, this is a, a bug that's on one of the bird's uh, legs. So these swallow bugs get onto the bird's legs and that way they are, they're able to move from, from nest to nest or site to, to site. And uh, it turns out that as the colony gets bigger, there are more birds that pass through the colony. And as more birds pass through the colony, more of these bugs are introduced to the site. It's more likely that somebody, some bird moving through is going to have bugs attached to its feet. And there, therefore, those bugs will, will reach that site. So that's one reason. There are other reasons that the bigger groups have more parasites, but this is, this is one of the, the major um, uh, ways that, that the increased parasitism is, uh, occurs. Now, we also wanted to ask, what is the real cost of these parasites? They look costly, they feed on blood, so presumably the birds are losing, are losing uh, uh, blood to these parasites. But we wanted to look and see, is there a real, uh, a real cost of um, parasitism for cliff swallows? So we investigated that with a, with a very simple sort of field experiment. We took colonies and we divided them in half. So we take one half of the colony. And for that, co that half of the colony, we would we would fumigate the nests. We would spray the outsides with an insecticide to kill off all of the swallow bugs. And then we left the other half of the colony untreated. So it, it was, was natural. And then we compared how well the babies did when the parasites were removed versus when they were not removed. And this is a, a really good a graphic example. These two baby swallows are the same age 10 days of age, uh, but the one on the right is from a, a fumigated nest where the, <clears throat> the swallow bugs had been removed. And the one on the left is from a, a, a nest in the non-fumigated section uh, that was subjected to, to natural numbers of, of parasites. So you can see the tremendous cost that these birds pay by having uh, parasites, by being exposed to parasites they're really not doing as well as they, as they could be. And this sort of a difference you, you see here is very pronounced in the big colonies where there are lots of parasites. In smaller colonies, 
lots of a, of a, of a difference between the, the fumigated and, and non-fumigated birds. So this seems to really indicate that these increased numbers of parasites in the larger colonies are in fact costly to the birds. And we've documented in many other ways that they are costly. Um, a, a little baby like this who's so malnourished probably is not even going to survive to, uh, to leave the nest. So parasites are very costly and there are more of them in big groups. So given that, one has to ask, why are these birds social at all? Uh, if it's so costly to, to be in big groups, then there have got to be some advantages that at least compensate the birds for parasites and other, um, other uh, costs. And one of, uh, two of those um, are the ability of birds uh, in groups to better avoid predators. And this is sort of, um, people often sort of think about this because you know that if, if uh, there are a whole bunch of, of individuals together, somebody is more, uh, is fairly likely to see a predator that might be approaching. They're more likely to, the vigilance is, is, is higher if you've got a lot of, of individuals together. Um, and then the other sort of advantage of being in a group is that you may be able to use each other to uh, find food. If food is hard to find, you may be able to pool your your collective knowledge and figure out where you can go to, to find food. Or if food is maybe dangerous to um, subdue, like if you're lions who are hunting um, or, or Cape buffalo, it's often advantageous for multiple individuals to cooperate to uh, attack that prey. So there are are a variety of ways that living in a group can increase your ability to, uh, to find, find food. So I wanna talk a little bit about, about both of these for, uh, for cliff swallows. Now, you know that you very rarely see actual predation on animals if you go out and, and spend time in the field. Um, now on, on animal planets, you see a lot of things getting eaten but it takes a lot of effort to go out and get those, the, that footage that they, that they show. And with cliff swallows, we don't see actual predation events very often either. But here is one that I can show you. So this is a, um, a, a, a colony on a culvert. And this is a bull snake that has come over the top of the culvert and is attacking the nest in that culvert. Interestingly enough, he didn't come up from the bottom, he came over the top. And by coming over the top and hanging on uh, up, up there above the, the, the concrete, he was able to reach the first nest on the, uh, on the wall and then use that to, to move in into the, into the colony. So here he is, this is the same, same snake, same, um, same event. So the, in this case, the snake is uh, hanging on to, uh, to, to one nest and uh, access another one. And bull snakes are very important predators of cliff swallows. They will eat the eggs, they will eat the, the babies, they will even trap adults in the nest and, and eat those. So we see a few of these predations each year, but we don't see enough of them to really do anything um, to study it systematically. So in order to, to study it, we had to create our own predator, which you know, was this guy. This is a, a blow up uh, snake, uh, something that you can, uh, that, that places sell, that you can put it in your, in your garden to keep birds away from your, your plants. Um, and it really looks pretty much like a real actual bull snake, uh, other than the head being a little bit ferocious. But uh, we use this, and by using this artificial snake, we were able to do controlled uh, experiments where we presented the snake to birds 
in colonies of, of say of different sizes. So here we would be on the edge of a colony in a, in a little wooden blind. Um, and then we would put the snake in his little house. Um, and then we would, we would pull the snake uh, at, a, at a particular rate uh, over the open ground to look to see how quickly the colony would detect this predator. And they would generally detect the predator by, but they would see it, they would fly overhead, they would, they would give alarm calls. And then we would measure how far out from the colony they detected it. So if you look here, if you look at the, at the, uh, the distance the model snake was detected in relation to colony size, what you see is that the bigger colonies are detecting that model snake at really quite far distances uh, out from the, uh, from the colony. Um, so in, at the bigger colonies, we would always, for all of these, we would start the snake at 100 meters away. And the big colonies, you can see, are detecting that snake almost as soon as it comes out of its, out of its box. Whereas the very small colonies with a zero detection distance, they're not finding it at all. They don't see it at all. So this illustrates that one of the potential advantages of being in a, in a group is obviously that you're, you're able to detect predators such as snakes uh, farther away. And then this gives you time to take action. Um, and this sort of effect, this sort of group size effect um, has been seen in a, in a variety of animals. And it seems to be just sort of an automatic consequence of having a lot of, of eyes happen to be looking around at any, at any particular time. But that's not the primary reason that cliff swallows live in groups. The primary reason they live in groups is to um, enhance their ability to, uh, to find food. So cliff swallows are, uh, are sort of interesting because they feed on uh, insects that can be sort of hard to find. They tend to go after swarming insects. So big, these big concentrations um, of insects. And these are very unpredictable in, in space and time. There may be one over here uh, brought, generated by, by localized uh, convection currents, thermals. Um, and it may be there for a while. And while it's there, it may, be, it may be a lot of insects there. But then it sort of peters out and then the birds have the, the challenge of trying to find another one of these. Um, so what they do, uh, apparently, is they simply observe others around them um, to see who happens to know where food is at that particular time. And they use the same cue we would use. They look to see who comes back with food in their, in their mouth. So here's a close swallow returning with a, with a beak full of insects. So what happens is if a bird is unsuccessful at finding food, it returns to its nest. It waits there. And when one of its neighbors comes back like this bird, then it will follow that neighbor uh, when the neighbor uh, exits the, the colony because that neighbor presumably knows where the food is at that particular time. And in this way, we say that the colony represents an information center. So there's, you can come, always come back to the colony if you don't know where the food is and you can observe neighbors and learn where food is that way. And obviously the more neighbors you have, then the more uh, efficient um, uh, this sort of information transfer can be. So we documented that was going on. So we wanted to know, does this translate into birds in bigger colonies finding more food? And it does. And the way that we determined that was, we wanted to see, okay, how much food are these, are these birds bringing back on their, uh, on their foraging trips? And we were able to determine how much food they were bringing back by loosely fitting a pipe cleaner around a, a baby's uh, throat. And this prevents the baby from swallowing the food that the parent brings back on a particular trip. Um, and you adjust 
stars right, you don't you don't have any problem. The food just sort of lodges there in the in the baby's throat, and then we're able to go in and remove the food and ascertain how much the parents were bringing back. And we found a very dramatic pattern, so that if you look at the amount of food that was brought back on each of these these foraging trips that the adult birds made, you can see this this dramatic increase with colony size. So those bigger colonies, the birds are bringing back uh, considerably more food per foraging trip. And in fact, the average difference between the smallest and largest colonies is about half a gram of food. And that may not sound like a lot, but it's a tremendous amount when you consider that these birds only weigh maybe 22 grams. And so a half gram more food per trip, and they may be making 16, 17 trips an hour, that translates into these birds finding a lot more food in these bigger colonies. And so we think that's probably the major way that, that these animals compensate for the cost of, of parasites and, and other, the other uh, drawbacks of, of living in, in groups. They're able to increase their foraging efficiency so much that it, it compensates them. Okay, I also wanted to talk a little bit about um, misdirected parental care um, because this is something that typically occurs whenever um, animals um, live in, in, in large uh, social groups. So there's, there's two ways this can happen. Uh, one is through extra pair fertilizations, okay? So a female is more likely to be fertilized by another male in the group um, if there are a lot of other males around. Um, so males ha have to guard their mate. They have to, you know, consort with her, keep her away from other males. But the likelihood of these sorts of extra pair fertilizations still increases in bigger groups. And from the point of view of the male, he might then be misdirecting his parental care towards some other male's babies. Now for egg-laying animals like cliff swallows, there's another way that they can misdirect their parental care. And that is by laying eggs in neighbor's nests. So this is known as, as brood parasitism. Cuckoos do this, of course, but they're, they're parasitizing other species of birds. With cliff swallows, they lay, they put eggs into other cliff swallows' nests. And when they do that, they're able to, uh, number one, um, avoid the cost of parental care themselves. And they may be able to uh, get those, those eggs into another nest that may be more successful than their own. And obviously there are, increased opportunities to lay in somebody else's nest uh, the, the more neighbors that you have. Now, we determine that cliff swallows lay eggs in others' nests. We determine that early on. But we also determined that there was something, uh, something else going on because we would sometimes find an egg that would appear in a nest and then miraculously a <laughs> hatch like five days later. Now, no egg can, can hatch in five days. Cliff swallows require about a 16 day incubation period. So what this seemed to suggest is that some of these eggs may have been incubated in other nests and then physically moved in to ones nearby. So we had some, some indirect evidence that that might be going on. So we, we decided we would try to get more direct evidence for this. So we marked eggs. So we would take eggs uh, as they were laid and put the nest number on the uh, outside of the, of the egg uh, using a Sharpie. So this was nest number four, for instance. So all of its eggs would get a four. So we would mark eggs in, within colonies and then look to see if some of these marked eggs showed up in another nest, because this would then indicate that the birds were moving eggs. And sure enough, 
this was the first case we, we discovered. So we took the eggs out and we photographed it. Uh, in this case, uh, an egg from nest number six showed up in nest number eight, two doors down. I think it was two days later. Um, so this is another way to parasitize nests. And in fact, uh, we've seen this happen. It's not, it's not real, real common. Uh, we've only seen it a few times, um, actually observed it a few times, but it does expand the way that, that these birds are able to, um, to parasitize uh, their neighbors. And that, that's an option that becomes available when you live in, uh, in, in big, big groups. Um, so it sort of illustrates, I think, that uh, I've always likened living in groups for cliff swallows to sort of a, a mixed blessing because there are good things about it and there are very bad things about living in a, in a group. And um, understanding uh, how those sort of go together has been um, much of, of, uh, of our research um, over the years. So I hope this has sort of given you a, a little bit of an appreciation for the, how marvelous this animal is, how interesting, how fascinating it is, um, and the complexities of, of social uh, life. So animals that live in groups are much more complex, show um, many uh, different sorts of adaptations from those that, that live more uh, more solitarily. Okay, so I think um, I think that will uh, end the the presentation, and I will will turn this back over to Jessica. Thank you, Dr. Brown. So um, there are a few questions that I see here. So I'll okay. share that with you right now. So somebody is asking, what is the most common diet of a cliff swallow? Well, they eat, uh, they eat flying insects, um, but they're very general. They basically take whatever is available. Um, we have, we have uh, detected over uh, 100 families of insects in the diet samples that we've taken. So it ranges from uh, mosquitoes and uh, leaf hoppers and flies all the way up to, to uh, uh, dragonflies, sometimes uh, grasshoppers. It's basically whatever is, <laughs> is, uh, is handy is what they will, they will go after. But they, they destroy a lot of, of pest insects as well. They, they eat a lot of corn borer moths in, um, in Nebraska, for instance. Thank you. Okay, the next question says, I'm an amateur birder. How okay. do I spot a cliff swallow when I'm out birding? Well, you, uh, you, it's, it's not a, an easy bird to see unless you're around one of these colony sites. And if you get around one of the colony sites, then you're gonna see a lot of them. But otherwise, I mean, so they're very patchy in their, in their distribution. Um, now, you can sometimes see birds during migration that are just passing over, but you obviously want to look, uh, you want to look for, you know, the orange rump. If you see an orange rump swallow, which is often, you know, that's what you see as you see one in flight passing by, uh, that will be a cliff swallow. Uh, migrants can be seen pretty much any place, uh, but they, you all, often see them over bodies of water for instance. So that's a good place to look. Um, but basically, you want to look around <laughs> bridges, <laughs> highway culverts, uh, those sorts of, of places where they, uh, where they, they nest. Okay, I have one more question here. And I, I do want to say if anybody has any questions, please feel free to add any more into the comments and Facebook for the Q&A in uh, Zoom. But the last question I have here says, uh, do, cliff, excuse me, do cliff swallows have any birds of prey that are predators to them? They do have, uh, they do have several 
uh, avian predators, the, uh, uh, the, the Cooper's hawk, which is uh, now a common bird, especially in urban areas. I'm sure there are many of them there in, in uh, San Juan Capistrano. Uh, Cooper's hawks go after them. Um, American kestrels will, uh, will sometimes attack them. Uh, even common grackles will uh, attack these birds when they're on the ground gathering mud. Um, so the birds will be gathering mud, the common grackles sort of stroll up to them, and the cliff swallows barely even respond to a grackle. You don't think of that as a predator, yet the grackle attacks them and may, 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 kill, the, uh, may kill a bird. Um, so grackles can be uh, substantial predators. Um, but I would say Cooper's hawks are probably uh, the, most, uh, the most widespread um, avian predator. Thank you. We just had another question pop up in the Q&A. Somebody's okay. asking, why don't they eat the parasite bugs? That's a, that's a very good question. Um, these parasites uh, have noxious uh, scent. And so if, if you've ever been unfortunate enough to <laughs> encounter bed bugs um, in a hotel room or, or wherever, you know that they have, a, they have an odor. And particularly if you crush one uh, between your fingers, they give off this sort of, you know, rotten almond odor. And it appears to be a, um, an adaptation so that vertebrate predators will not uh, eat them. So there are no vertebrates that are known to eat any of the bed bugs or, or swallow bugs. Um, now there are spiders that eat them and ants that eat them, but no vertebrates will eat them. And it's likely because they have this just really noxious uh, scent. Wow, who knew? <laughs> uh, so I have another question from our okay. Q&A. Somebody's asking, this is from Kathy, how long does it take them to build their nest? Okay, and that also changes with the size of the group. In a, uh, in a big group, birds can often build their nest in as short as uh, three to four days. In a small group, the typical time can be two weeks or more. And you may ask, well, well, what the difference? Well, the difference is that in a big group, you generally can build your nest and share walls with neighboring nests. And that cuts down on, your, on the time it takes you to build a, a nest. If you can just fit one in between two existing nests, then you can do it really fast. In a small colony where there are not very many nests, you often have to build a whole nest from scratch. And that takes you a, a lot longer. So uh, in general, birds in bigger colonies build nests faster. That enables them to start nesting earlier, which may also be a way to compensate for these bugs, because if you nest earlier, you end up generally doing better and you can sort of get ahead of the, of the parasite um, life cycle. So, I mean, all these things are sort of inter interrelated. So building a nest affects when you can begin laying and when you be can begin laying affects how many parasites you may have. So it all depends on, on the size of the group. makes a lot of sense. Well, I'm looking and I don't think we have any more questions popping up. So I want to say thank you so much, Dr. Brown, for your time okay. today. You bet. I enjoy talking. I always enjoy talking about cliff swallows. <laughs> well, and, and uh, we, we are so happy that you do. <laughs> I hope that uh, it, it uh, you know, let people appreciate the bird a little bit more for when they, uh, when they see them and both uh, there and, and any place in the, uh, in the country. Absolutely. Well, thank you again. And thank you to everybody who tuned in today online. Um, we're so happy that you were able to join us virtually. And hopefully we can do this in person next year. Next year. I hope so. Yes, absolutely. Okay. All right. Thank you, everybody. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Brown.